previously on Cascading Leadership. How do I get to the point where I have the space or maturity or discipline or whatever word that you need to have these sort of conversations? Like what do people need to be doing who are earlier in their career to mature in this way, to be more productive in their interpersonal communications and relationships and, and business conversations? I would say that the starting point is understanding the principles and reading about emotional intelligence. The most impactful leaders are do have really strong emotional intelligence because at the end of the day, that is how people operate. That is the framework that drives all of us is our emotions. We aren't machines, we are humans. And with that comes that really studying, understanding, taking assessments to know more about yourself. What is your disc profile? There's Myers-Briggs, there's a thousand different assessments. Learn that about yourself and learn it about others so you can operate differently. And now for the conclusion of our conversation with Becky Chung. One of my, I'll be touched on this a little bit of intentionally hiring people for your team that are different. Sometimes that means hiring somebody that's so different, you don't even like them. But understanding that person is so incredibly valued because what likely drives that is that they're so different than you. Their style is different, their communication is different, their needs are different. And being able to honor that they're different and take advantage of that experience yourself. And so this does sound like maybe more advanced, but I actually think people are far more natural at this if they have a little bit of bravery than they realize because you live and breathe personal relationships all day. That's what work relationships are. It just happens within the confines of a workplace. So you can practice this on your spouse. You can practice this on your family. You can practice this on your child. These types of principles are actually gonna be really effective with any relationship that you have. You said something that is absolutely salient and I think important for new leaders and that is that the practice piece, because it, especially if it doesn't come to you naturally, and I think, you know, if I'm being transparent, I don't think that it was for me. I sure. am someone who is a very introverted and and the advantage of that is, is that for me, it's why I'm such an intense reader and, and I can apply most anything that I've read to a given situation, but that's how I'm wired. But what you're saying is that when you're talking about like the emotional intelligence piece, the other side of it, is that's how you get to that point. Another book recommendation is Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis mm -hmm. Bradbury. And because the, what that book also does is the other part of what you said is that, that assessment and that assessment has to be occurring on a fairly regular basis, especially as you're learning and getting under your skis to, to understand who you are as a new leader. So in that text, it has the assessment and it does self-reflection and how you perceive others and get along with others. But then the added nugget that you mentioned is the idea of the Myers-Briggs or DISC or Hogan or whichever one you choose. It is important to be, if you can get that going early in your career, to your point, it helps you to drive those to drive those outcomes more organically as opposed to, you know, like you said, you know, you have to move the widgets because that's when you do take that step back and say, well, wait a minute, why isn't LB able to move the widgets? What barriers might we be facing? That's what causes you that ask the question. So yes, a couple of great nuggets there. There's one other oh, piece sure. that I think is really important with this when you're talking to new leaders. It's okay to screw it up, still mess it up. Yep. There are times I go into a conversation, I hang up and I go, wow, that didn't feel good. That didn't yeah. go how I expected. I don't think I got the point across that I intended to. And that's where these aren't one-time events. These are ongoing relationships. So sometimes as a leader, you have to pick up the phone and say, hey, I don't like how that went, or I think I made a mistake, or the message I was trying to convey isn't the one that was heard. Yeah. And so that vulnerability and that willingness to not only be brave and make a mistake, but to own your mistakes. And that comes back to trust. Jim might remember this. So when I was, we worked at the same organization and when we did, I think I shared this story with you. I had written like 12 contracts down in one of the dealerships and I had a great sales day, but I forgot the information. It was the phone number on one of the contracts. And my manager was going through each of the contracts and I missed information and he absolutely flipped out. And in that moment, I said, when I become a leader of people, other people, there are two things, two rules that I have. You have to make mistakes, you have to ask questions. And I felt because then that would give them the license to feel like they were okay. Because one, if they're making mistakes, they're trying. Mm -hmm. And two, if they're asking questions, 
they're naturally inquisitive. Mm -hmm. It always, frankly, to give people that license, it, it takes away the fear of getting it wrong because I want you to ask the question. So you might get it wrong. In context. So as a new leader, I think one of the lessons I, it took me a little longer to learn is about providing context to allow people to apply judgment. And so what that looks like is helping people understand what is the outcome you're driving towards why help them understand the whys behind things so that when they face that situation, that isn't the easy yes, no, that they can go, okay, I understand where we're headed. I can make the right call. That's in the right, in the best interest of the team, in the best interest of the company. Another thing I like to talk to my team about a lot is the spirit of a policy, the spirit of a process. Why is it in place? Because then there are times where you can't follow every process perfectly. There is gray in this world. And so sometimes you just have to make a call and go, I'm achieving what the goal of that process is just through a different path. And I want to tie back to one quick thing that, uh, that caught my attention as, uh, as we were talking. I think, Becky, you mentioned, hey, one of the things that's important is for people to try to figure themselves out early, take the assessments and get a good understanding of yourself as you move forward in your career. The thing that resonated with me about that particular comment is not just take these things as just a, an exercise in taking them, but looking at the gaps and understanding those are the things that are going to keep you from moving forward. So you need to be humble enough to understand that you have gaps and not camp out in an area where you're digging your feet in, in a particular area that might be toxic to your growth. And that's a tough thing for early career people to do because it happens to us when we're in high school and in college, we think we know everything. When we're early careers, we think we know everything. And as you get further on, you're like, oh, I didn't really know as much as I thought I did. So the earlier that discipline around introspection and actually continuous okay. improvement can be built, the better off you're going to be on the, on, on your career trajectory. So this is, th these are great call outs that are coming out. Jim, to that point, it's about knowing yourself and how that's going to show up to your team, right? That's the important piece of it. Not just don't just know yourself, but understand what that means your team is going to experience by working with you. One of the things that makes all of this difficult is everybody walks in with a set of perceptions or biases into these interactions. So how do you build the discipline to hold those biases back? I'm confronted by a situation. I'm reacting a certain way. I'm going to automatically jump to what I believe is the root cause. How do you wind that back so that you're actually having a constructive analysis of the situation versus just an assumptive analysis of the situation? It's asking the questions. It's always doing working backwards to make sure that those foundational elements have happened and that you are, again, working on the same problem because there's many times where I lead a recruitment team right now. So I'll get the, the hiring manager is being unreasonable. We're not delivering what they need. So I start asking the questions. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? And as I start working back, because it's easy for me to want to jump to that conclusion as well, working back with them to say, okay, what have you done? What haven't you done? Why hasn't it worked? What questions have you asked? What have you done to control your work, to control your outcome? And a lot of times there's a belief in there, I have to change, whether that's I don't need to do that, or that doesn't work typic, or this person's just challenging. And this could be any team, to be honest, like everybody has that stakeholder, right? So just working back with them to make sure they have done those things and then modify those beliefs of you do owe this to yourself to do these things. You do owe this to your stakeholder to help tell the story of the activities that are going on. And at the end of the day, you own finding a solution. Through partnership. As I was listening, to what you were saying the the idea of going through that process is also helping to identify those gaps because we don't know that the gap is there. It's oftentimes through a 360 feedback, which is along the lines of that, along the lines of that path where you're going. As you're answering the question, you're putting someone in a position where they have to go through a methodical process of going. Yep. Yep. Oh, wait a minute. Let me think about that for a second. Then they may have to go back a step mm -hmm. in order to catch and then move forward. So that you're helping them to go through a self-analysis that helps drive the outcome that you were talking about. So that's a definite uh, key nugget there. And my goal is that they learn through every situation because I don't want to have 
keep having the same conversation because I'm not teaching them how to think, I'm giving them answers. And so I think that's also an important practice as a leader is as much as those questions are to gain answers for you to make sure you know the problem, it's also teaching them how to think through these situations in the future. One of the things that I notice is that as we hire a new professionals coming into the world of work, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid on just what you said, teaching people how to think. I don't think high school and college really equips us well to critically think and analyze. I think high school and college, at least my experience has been, it's conditioned me to answer the right question or find the right answer instead of deconstructing the process. So that, that creates a unique set of problems for new leaders in not only solving problems, but also building up the entire organization to be able to think critically through that. What have you seen in terms of the gap when new workers enter the workplace and their ability to critically think through certain problems and build themselves up in that sort of way? Before you answer that, Jim yeah. stole my question. It's a great question. It's a great question. So certainly no one's going to come out of college understanding how things work in a business setting or in any organization setting. And I would see, say even a professional is going to need help in working through those questions because the data, the context is different for every organization, whether it's the culture, it's the why, it's the mission. So as much as, yes, I, generationally, do you have to help them understand some of the things that happen in a business setting and teach them how to operate in a professional environment versus an academic. Of course, that's natural. I actually don't think it's as different as when you have a seasoned professional coming in and having to help them apply that same critical thinking in a new setting. Because depending on the type of environment, it could be very different. The One of the reasons I love the organization I work for is because of our approach to innovation and being bold and failing forward are some of the core principles. And that for me is an environment I'm going to thrive. Helping someone understand what that's like if they come from a very like stringent hierarchical environment is going to be incredibly different no matter how many years of experience they have. And so helping them understand what that looks like, what that their belief that they can make mistakes, their belief that it's okay to push ideas those things are all still going to be there. I think for a new grad, it's about finding the information, looking for solutions in a different way, and knowing that there isn't always a right answer. In school, there's often, you're taught that there's one right answer, and we all know in the world of work, there's 17 right answers, and you just got to apply the one that makes the most sense for you. That's absolutely a true statement. I was laughing as you were finishing that. Yeah, I think that transition from the right answer to multiple right answers, <laughs> and multiple things. And it harkens back to Jim's question about this whole idea of being able to handle transformational elements that as you're moving from one environment to the other. I think that, I don't know if this is a more specific question, is mm -hmm. that what have you seen from folks that are either transitioning into the into your system from, again, like a vertical shift or new students? And I'm actually selfishly asking this question because have students that I'm responsible for. And so I'd love to hear, and digital transformation is something that is, I think, very important as we move forward. What are yeah. some of the things that you see as gaps and things that I can take back to these students and say, hey, this is someone who obviously knows their stuff. Here are some recommendations. So if I were advising new students, and that's I think such an important part of our workforce right now that's entering into a very unique circumstance. Us as professionals don't even know necessarily how to navigate the situation we're in. So letting them know it's okay to ask questions and they should ask questions and to look at every opportunity as learning, even the mistakes. So I have a fantastic advisor who I work with. And one of the things that she reminds me when I'm having those tough days is to just say, okay, I made a mistake. Okay. I'm going to do it differently next time and to move on and to give grace to myself and to others because it's so important. And so that's what I would encourage for college kids today, high school students, anyone who's really entering the business setting. We're seeing so many people change careers right now into different settings is be okay making mistakes, ask questions. Don't be afraid to try and learn more that's outside what's right in front of you. I think that's one of the reasons I have found success in my career is just my natural 
curiosity to understand what someone's circumstances are, what the challenges my stakeholders are experiencing, what the business is going through, really just having that appetite to understand all of the things that are going on around me, because it continues to give me the right context to understand how I could maybe move things forward just a little bit. It's a great point, Becky. And I want to expand on something that you just mentioned. You were talking about the willingness to make mistakes. My One of my default mantras is my expectation of anybody that joins my team is to fail fast, fail often, because it's through failure that you're going to actually have leaps of innovation in terms of, in terms of what you're trying to get to. And what's interesting about that is when you're looking at an early career or fresh grad entering the workforce, you've had 18 to 22 years of conditioning of don't fail. You need to get the grade, get the right mm-hmm. answer. So it's compl- like, when you look at the educational preparedness for the world of work, it's 180 degrees apart. And it's interesting to me that, and we hear managers talk all the time about, oh, I'm getting all these new hires and they're not equipped to succeed. There's a gap there it has to be figured out. Okay. How do we get our educational system aligned in such a way that it drives business outcomes and that acceleration part is smoothed out because there's a lot of building before we actually pick up speed. I want to spin it to the other end of the spectrum and I'm going to make this, I don't know, hit the center of the circle. So I've watched your career. I've watched the transformation that you're a part of at Cielo. And I'd imagine at some point before this, uh, these initiatives took off, you had a group of people that had reached a level of equilibrium where they're like, okay, this seems pretty stable. And now you introduce this high growth transformation effort. And you're talking about presenting this to an established workforce. So how do you navigate or reignite that appetite for innovation or transformation when you have a stable workforce that tends to be more mature? What's the process of driving that? So a couple of things I would say is I don't think in this day and age you truly do find that many stable organizations because to a degree, I think stability, what precedes lack of growth in an environment, especially when you consider the economies that we're experiencing around the world, that's just not the way the world is right now. Five years ago might have been different. And so to your question about how do you continue to drive innovation in an environment where there's more stability, there's always ways to make things better for yourself. And so that's what we focus on is how can we get rid of tasks that aren't effective? How do we get away from the things that aren't meaningful? What could we be doing that's different? And I believe in blue sky thinking and bad ideas foster good ideas. So there is no bad idea of just allowing people to really just have free dialogue about what they would change in their own world if I gave them a magic wand, if I had all the money in the world, what's one thing I could do that could make your job a little bit easier? And that's how I continue to spark that innovation with them. Becky, thank you for being a part of the show. I think that some of the elements that I thought were were powerful about what you said is the whole idea of embracing your vulnerability as a leader, really allowing your sense of truth to shine through and candor, right? Really having these conversations Mm -hmm. that is being able to identify who you are and having conversations with others that allow them to have the ability to ask questions and to make mistakes. And my my last parting question or statement is that, is there any key takeaway that you would like to leave the audience with? Invest in yourself, knowing yourself so you can be authentic and bring what you bring to the table and then give room to others to bring what they bring to the table. Awesome. Thank you. And For those of you that are having the opportunity to listen, you can find us on most of the platforms that are out there that are sharing the podcast. We are growing our social media footprint. So you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find us on TikTok. And we are now also on YouTube. And we look forward to you checking in with us next time on the Cascading Leadership Podcast.